welcome to Acton Line, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Gabriel Jaja, producer. Today we're bringing you a conversation with theologians Daryl Bach and Jonathan Armstrong, with Dan Churchwell, Acton's Director of Program Outreach. In this episode, they discuss the pros and cons of virtual reality and its impact on Christian worship. In their book, Virtual Reality Church, Bach and Armstrong lay out a strategy on how to joyfully communicate the teachings of Jesus Christ through disruptive technologies in this new digital age. They examine how this can affect how we worship in person, but also how we can leverage virtual reality to evangelize the Christian faith where many are persecuted. You can find additional resources in the show notes of this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash actonline. If you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act In Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Welcome to Act In Line. My name is Dan Churchwell and I serve as the Director of Program Outreach here at the Institute. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Jonathan J. Armstrong and Dr. Daryl Bach on their fascinating new book, Virtual Reality Church, Pitfalls and Possibilities. Jonathan earned his Ph.D. from Fordham University and is professor of Bible at Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. Along with his teaching load, he consults on the intersection of education and technology at various Christian colleges and universities and serves as president of the Aqueduct Project. Dr. Bach earned his Ph.D. at the University of Aberdeen and is the executive director of cultural engagement at the Hendricks Center and senior research professor in New Testament studies at Dallas Theological Seminary. He has authored dozens of books and is the host of the Table podcast. Welcome to Act in Line, gentlemen. Good to be with you. It's great to be with you. Now, you've written a, a fascinating book, and, and I'm really glad we're having this discussion. Um, in the last three or four years, there's been a lot of talk on uh, industrial revolutions and the, the fourth industrial revolution, um, the World Economic Forum talks about the fourth industrial revolution like this, that the fourth industrial revolution is the digital revolution and is a fusion of technologies that blurs the lines between physical, digital, and biological spheres. And the article goes on to say, um, they argue that the fourth industrial revolution is very distinct from the previous three in the velocity, scope, and systems impact. Of this one, and and I really think your book fits into that kind of uh, category that we're in, trying to think through how are we using technologies, how are technologies affecting us, and your your special book on the idea of virtual reality church uh, really adds a very interesting avenue into that conversation. C- can one of you briefly tell us the genesis of the project? So we we probably have different vantage points, and we certainly have been tracking with technology from different points, but our journeys converged in 2016. That was when Dr. Bach's associate at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, Ramesh Richard, convened uh, 2,500 pastoral trainers from 101 countries in Bangkok, Thailand, at the Global Congress, um, Global Proclamation Congress for Pastoral Trainers. And out of some actually serendipitous sessions, we met and started working on um, sort of an ad hoc project about how technology could extend the reach of traditional theological classrooms at Bible colleges and seminaries like Dallas and Moody. And we did some online work, discussions following that, and then I pitched to Dr. Bach whether he'd be willing to co-write this piece with me, and it was kind of a dream come true. I've been reading Dr. Bach's books since I was a seminary student, but he said yes, and we set to work in 2019. Yeah, my my way in, I actually was in a back room during uh, the Cape Town Convention, which was the first effort to have a global meeting and do something digitally at the same time. Uh, and I was responsible for 
collecting and editing, putting together a team that collected and edited information on all the Senate, on all the, the sub themes that were going on during that, during that week and sending them out to sites globally around the world. That was back in 2010. And then, uh, and then I've been working online um, at, a, at a continental level really almost ever since uh, I share in the book in the very first chapter what convinced me that um, there was a dimension to what happens online that the church needed to think about. And that was when I taught a class um, from Dallas uh, in Perth, Australia, which was a hybrid uh, where I spent um, six weeks online with the students before I ever walked into the class and physically met with them. Uh, and I knew more about what those students needed in terms of the topic that we were dealing with, where their strengths and weaknesses were individually than I had in any class I had taught in Dallas in 30 years. Wow. And all of a sudden it dawned on me that this, this medium had a potential in certain spheres that, um, that rivaled anything that could happen in the classroom. Yeah, you're, I, I really appreciate that. What, one thing I really loved about the book is that you really add both a, both of you are practitioners in your own ways in kind of this virtual space, along with being educators, as well as the historical aspect. I, I really did uh, appreciate uh, media ecology and, and media ethics as an area of study for me and speaking and, and teaching on. And so I really enjoyed that, that or appreciated that for a book like this, you spent the time to build both the practitioner angle and the historical angle. And you, you did a really, both of you did a really great job. And so so before we get into more of the nuts and bolts of the book itself, uh, can, can one of you discuss, just give us quickly, what is for a viewer that, or a listener that might not know, can you give us a differentiation or a, a definition of virtual reality or, or augmented reality? Sometimes people use those interchangeably. Would one of you like to define just what do we mean by virtual reality, let, let alone virtual reality church? Well, I'll just dive in by saying there's a technical definition and then there's the problem we had writing the book. <laughs> sure. So the technical definition is normally when you're thinking about virtual reality, uh, VR, that kind of stuff you're thinking about the goggles that you put on in, in an augmented uh, a surround sound and vision uh, context in which people uh, are engaged in an immersed environment digitally. They aren't just looking at a screen. That's the technical definition. The constant problem we had in writing the book was that one, that's a small segment of people's digital involvement overall and a small segment of how the church, at least currently, is engaged digitally. And there's enough overlap between that and all the other forms of digital communication that we didn't feel like we could limit ourselves to just that particular environment, but really wanted to talk about the whole scope of the digital possibilities for a church and to wrestle with where that overlaps with technical virtual reality or not. And, uh, and so we were constantly in our writing and our team writing together, going back and forth with one another about, all right, are we talking technically here? Or are we talking more generically? Because one of the principles in the book was, is that you have to think through the medium that you're using with its strengths and weaknesses in order to understand how, what you can best do with it and where its weaknesses are. And depending on the medium that you're in, even within digital realities um, is impacted by that principle. That's good. Jonathan, would you like to add anything uh, to those comments? Uh, right on. I, we could, I think it's worth saying that um, VR is definitely an area of technology that's undergoing rapid development. So I like to cite Jerome Lanier. Jerome Lanier is one of the godfathers of the VR industry. He was mm -hmm. doing tech talks in San Francisco and the Valley in the 80s on technology of VR. And is considered the father of, of virtual reality in, in many respects. He is. And in yeah. his book, The Dawn of the New Everything, he gives 53 definitions of VR. <laughs> I cite that because even somebody who knows the technology as intimately as Jerome can't pin it down exactly. So I, I think the reason why we identified this as a really crucial topic for the church is because I think Mark Zuckerberg's vision of VR is basically correct, that this is the next computing platform. That means that all this swirling internet data around us, sooner or later, we're going to be principally 
interacting with it in what some call spatially computing environments. So we're going to be accessing it through VR, yep. whether that's goggles or AR glasses or something else. And so if that's the way that we interact with the internet, that's going to fundamentally change the way that churches need to learn to interact with online media. And it really probably brings us past a tipping point where churches ought to consider the convening potential of online avenues. So that's, that's really the core of the book. Right, because when, when most people think of virtual re- virtual reality, they're going to think of the glasses, you know, Oculus Two um, for the virtual reality side, which again is is owned by Facebook, correct? That is correct. Yep, and we we don't even get a cut of those profits. I don't, I don't think Daryl gets <laughs> any of that money. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully it'll trickle down somewhere. But uh, no, the innovation has been fascinating the last twenty years, and kind of where I want to engage the topic, though. Um, I know there are a lot of, both of you are are, uh, scholars in the New Testament and uh, church history, and and there are ways we can, we will get to talking a little bit about the specific thesis, but I'm interested first in the broader ecosystem or media ecology. You do a great job. You pull the most famous quote, one of the most famous quotes from Neil Postman, uh, who's talking about, you know, post, uh, roughly 1500, 50 years after the printing press, you didn't have just Europe and a printing press, you had a new Europe. And many people are mapping that conversation on to the year 2000, that in the year 2000, you just didn't have the world plus the internet, you had a new world. And, and that the, you know, it, it is changing almost everything we understand, thus the conversation from the World Economic Forum, you know, about how deep these changes are going. And so when, when you talk about media ecology, that it really does seem to change the ecology of a situation when you introduce a new technological change. And uh, one thing, like I already said, is is the book you do a really great job of talking about, largely in the Protestant world, but some great references to the Catholic Church doing some of these things too. But the innovative nature of of largely the revivalists, the revivalist uh, preachers and theologians throughout time, Charles Finney and others engaging these topics. And so do, do you find that this is just another I mean, is it fair to say you argue that this is just another technological advancement in a long line of technological advancements in regards to religious teaching and and preaching? Uh, I'd say yes and no. Um, I mean, in one sense, yes, it is related to other advancements that have been made for sure. And that's why we trace that history and also traced kind of the way in which each time that new innovation got introduced, there was this kind of push and pull between do we go here or not? And if so, how do we do it? That kind of thing. But I also think it's unique because I think what what digital connectedness does more than almost anything else uh, is is it, it opens up the amount of voices that we're exposed to that are not limited to just our geographic location. And I think that has um, made our world more complex and has made um, and has overwhelmed people uh, almost to a degree in terms of the amount of information they're being asked to process and the number of choices that they have about what they do with what they hear and what they're uh, and what's being presented to them. I like to explain it to my students that uh, back in the 1920s when radio first became popular, people called those radio ministries the Church of the Air. Now, we look back and we say, that's not a church. It's not a radio church. It's a radio ministry, and you've got your churches. But what happened there is radio ministry so changed churches— that they they didn't know the difference between a radio church and a church and a and a radio ministry at that time. Radio so dramatically changed the church, and then in the fifties and sixties and seventies into the eighties and nineties too, television came along. People called it the electric church. Now now we call it television ministry, televangelism. But the presence of television ministry so radically changed the church, there was a time they just called it the electric church. And I think that's what's happening now, too, in our own age with online media changing the church and specifically virtual reality changing the church. We're calling it virtual church. 
A day will come when we call it virtual reality ministry, and we can clearly separate that out from what the church is. But by the time that clarity comes, what we call church will be really radically reshaped. And you can see it. You can see it in the fact that there's not a pastor or a priest anywhere in in um, in highly technological environments that not only is not the only voice that the, his parishioners are hearing, but in fact, in some cases, has to take into account, at least to some degree, what those other voices are saying as they seek to minister and disciple people. And so that's a very important change. It used to be before all this that the local church and the local pastor was the spiritual leader for the people that that were connected to their particular church. That is no longer the case, and there is no going back. Right, and, and there's there's a... A philosophical concern. I, I've listened to some of the other interviews you've done, and, and some are, are very you know, ecclesial. Uh, we, they talk a lot about the the church and the New Testament and, 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 and textual issues regarding some of these concerns. But I want to keep it a little um, a little more meta for a moment. Uh, I mean, when you think about the technology we're embracing, many people, like you said, their, their local pastor, their embodied church, their the the people that they would see on a day-to-day basis, the pastor was the authority. And now with the the pixelated nature of our world, I mean, you can, you know, YouTube enters into the, in, into the frame and you can have a hundred of the best pastors, if you will, to use that phrase, in the world at your, at your fingertips, right? And, and so the competition, if you will, seems really advanced and complex at this time um, psychologically. But, but what is hanging over my concern are two quotes, two ideas. Um, I think both of you are probably very familiar with C.S. Lewis and the Abolition of Man, his third chapter, uh, which the title of the book comes from, you know, The Abolition of Man, the lecture. Um, he argues in that third chapter that each generation exercises power over its successors. As well, if, if you mate that with the idea of Roy Amara, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Roy Amara. He was a, uh, a futurist. He died several years ago, um, several decades ago. But he has the, uh, the aphorism, we tend to overestimate the effect of a technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. So that there's this overestimation in the short term, and then we underestimate the effect in the long run. Oh, man, I like that second quote. Yeah, so Roy Amara, A-M-A-R-A, um, and, and, and so I, as I listen to you, and, and you know, there's, there's a whole scope of techno-optimist to pe- techno-pessimism, you know, there's a spectrum, and, uh, and I would argue technology is not neutral, you know, it, it's a tool, but it, it's not necessarily neutral. So how do, you, how do you think about when you're thinking through virtual reality in, in that frame um, that each generation exercises power over its successor? So, you know, my kids right now or, or your grandkids, you know, they will be inheriting a diff, like what Jonathan just said, a different kind of church or a different kind of experience. And they're thinking differently as a result. I mean, I, 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 I don't, I'm not a techno-optimist or a techno-pessimist. I want to be a techno-realist. Um, I, I, I want to think through what technology, how it functions, what it does to people, how you impact it. I, I, I have this illustration that I like to use. There are two illustrations I have for the digital world. Um, one of them is when I grew up and taught, was taught to think, I was taught to think in outlines, in an organized thought, Okay. You know, here's point one, here's point two, sub point A, B, C, et cetera. And what I tell people is when my kids go to a web page, they do not think in an outline thought manner. They go wherever they want to go next, given what the page is presenting them. And so it's just a different way of pursuing information and a different way of putting things together. That's the first observation I make. Second observation I like to make, and I use this through MTV, if you look at MTV, and I did this, I did this exercise with my wife uh, several years ago. I said, "Look at how long an image is on the screen," and I count, started to count, and I never got to the number four. You know, I go one, 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 two, one, two, three, one. 
When, and I go five and six minutes and never get to the number four. Yep. And that doesn't even take, that's the visual that pe- that our kids are processing. And then I say kids. And then, and then, the, and then that doesn't even take into account the line streaming that's happening sometimes underneath, et cetera, and the multitasking that they're being. And that's how they're constantly exposed to the processing of information. So what does that do to the way I think and the way in which I engage and the way in which I uh, put things together and connect dots? I mean, there's just all kinds of aspects for what both of those models mean. And then let me add one more element to it. And I alluded to this earlier, but now I'm going to elaborate on it. And that is my generation grew up in a largely monocultural Context. Now I'm thinking about here in the West, a very Judeo-Christian net society in which there were basically a singular or a singular set of voices that came out of a similar space, that kind of thing. And as the world shifted on us technologically, the older generation um, reacted to that because we're constantly forced to adjust. Younger people have lived with the multiple voices from the moment they were born. And that has impacted the way in which they also react to what's going on around them. So I actually think one of the things that is responsible for the way the different generations have weighed what's going on around them is the nature of that experience. So that undervalued impact of the digital world, that's what I think I'm describing when I use that example. When we when we talk about this, this idea, though, of... of um and you bring it up several times. Again, I really appreciate the honesty of the book. This, this isn't necessarily a advertisement for Virtual Reality Church. It's a, it's a description of what's happening, what is, but you, you do weigh the consequences, um, the pros and cons, the classic Neil Postman seven questions to ask any technology I, I hear echoing or, or Jacques Ellul, I think he had 92, you know, questions to ask any technology. I, I hear those in the background of, of, your, of your commentary. So I really did appreciate that in the text. Um, when, when you talk about virtual reality church and and you list kind of some of the players maybe Jonathan on the historical end can you can you describe a little bit of how what what was the evolution of virtual reality church say i mean it really the last 15 years is kind of when it's come upon us can you can you sketch that out briefly for us what that looked like yeah, good. Yeah, there's still a lot of mystique and hype around VR. And so a lot of people, when they hear virtual reality church, they assume, oh, we're just going to live with our goggles on in an artificial world and never have real relationships again. Of course, that's a that would be a that's a travesty, right? So no one's advocating for that. No one is advocating that we replace our pastors with pixels. No, real human relationships will require an embodied form indefinitely because we're embodied creatures. We're not going to be uploading our consciences to the internet. That's my firm opinion. So, uh, right. So none of that is what we're talking about. But what we are talking about is using cutting edge tools, in this case, goggles, VR stereoscopic goggles to access and interact with uh, the communicative potential of online technologies. So churches have been experimenting with online media as a primary way of interacting really since there's been the Internet since 1994, uh, 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 Presbyterian, a retired Presbyterian pastor by the name of Charles uh, Henderson has been uh, opened up a website that he proclaimed to be a church. Most people have disagreed with him, but he tried to found an online church since 1994. Um, the Church of Fools was has a very inauspicious name, but in 2004, there was a, a project opened called the Church of Fools, so named because it was sponsored by a magazine called The Ship of Fools, which was an online forum. And that really changed a lot of public opinion about about the the possibility of online churches. So um, that group, the the Church of Fools, brought together the the Bishop of London to give sermons and a lot of other top-profile clergymen to participate in that project. Basically, what that was is um, an interactive online form of communicating. People would, you know, use their cursors to push around the keys to have avatars run around and speak with one another and gesticulate and so on. So it was a form of acting out as an online community 
a church service and experiencing communal worship. So that was kind of the high water mark of 2004. Incidentally, also of that same era, uh, the Diocese of Oxford, the, the Anglican Diocese of Oxford, opened up an online congregation, and that was completely cutting edge for 2004. That one was out of an initiative called the Fresh Expressions Movement within Anglicanism. And then things continued on. There was a lot of new live streaming that took place in the, the late aughts, the early teens of this of this uh, millennium. And then recently, of course, COVID has been the, the latest chapter in that story where everyone now has considered the possibility of online services. And And it really, like you said, the last year has really advance some of these conversations, I think. You know, it, it was already advancing, but it, it's just accelerated, I guess, the, the conversation. Um, so, so tell us, when, when we talk about virtual reality church, the, the cynic or, or the person who is so used to ingrained in the idea of church as physical space, why does there even need to be virtual reality church? Like, what, 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 is, what is the problem, to, to use one of Neil Post, what is the problem that this is solving? Huh. I don't know if it's a problem that it's solving, but it certainly is stepping in with some kinds of connections that you never could have conceived of before. And, and what I mean by that is if you, if you think about where people are in, in countries where there's high persecution, that kind of thing, the opportunity, at least potentially, that a virtual church offers to people in terms of protection and layers of protection as they're engaged is extremely significant. If you think about how do you minister to people who can't be mobile and can't get to a building um, in order to participate in a community and have spiritual input, um, certainly uh, the interactivity of what digital, of what a digital engagement allows, unlike radio and unlike television, um, opens up possibilities. The challenge of the use of the digital area, it seems to me, is recognizing what it gives you and what it doesn't give you. And so um, I tell people, if you're only using your online um, capabilities to simply stream your service, to do to, to be a window into something that's happening somewhere else, you're not utilizing this uh, medium in what it's capable of doing for you as a ministry. Um, it is the interactivity of this ministry and the potential to reinforce what happens in the normal flow of ministry, where I think it has its greatest potential to be supportive of ministries uh, that are taking place. Um, and also in those places where, where engaging in ministry itself is dangerous or challenging. And it also connects, has the potential to connect people to an effective ministry who otherwise might be isolated geographically or otherwise. It has that potential as well. So it's thinking through what the strength of the medium is in contrast to simply utilizing it. Now, now when I think of that, um, if, if I hear you right, you're saying, you know, those in either developing nations or or nations where um, the gospel, the Christian gospel of, of Jesus Christ w would not be welcome, that that's the medium that you think this, this might be best, you, or, or at least currently suitable and, and usable for? Is that, is that right? And, and then one other element, and that is to reinforce the teaching ministry and the engagement ministry of the church in various ways. We've utilized, in my church, we've util utilized Zoom during the COVID period when, when, our church, when our community split. We meet in our building, but we also have people who meet online. We have two to three times the people meeting with us online as the people who are coming to the building. And so, so the question is, how do you reinforce what's happening in the room, what's going on? So what we have done is we have a normal service in the morning, which we stream online, but then we have put together a Zoom call in the afternoon that allows our people in our church to interact with the people who delivered the message and to process it, to reprocess it, if you will, in a reinforced kind of way that is simple logistically to pull off and that works very effectively for those who choose to utilize it. And it becomes a, re a community reinforcing experience for the series that we're preaching or for the book that we're going through or what we're discussing as a community theologically. And, and maybe your third point there is good. I'm going to, I'm going to, Jonathan, you, you and I, 
have gone back and forth on this topic for years. You and I had the privilege of teaching to get, at least it was my privilege uh, to teach with you, you know, for the last, uh, for six years when we, when we both taught in Spokane, Washington together. And uh, Sherry Turkle is someone who I've, I've gained a lot of insight from and uh, from her book, Alone Together and Reclaiming Conversation. Uh, th- this quote comes from Reclaiming Conversation. She argues that technology gives us the illusion of companionship without the demands of friendship. And piggybacking off what Dr. Bach just said there, um, it, it seems like discipleship or engagement in the church, that technology can be a barrier, not a, uh, a benefit. And, and so have you, how have you thought through that angle of uh, can you really have true discipleship through the medium of either virtual reality or, or, or a Zoom-like platform? Yeah. So the, I think the thing to do there, Dan, is to 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 ask yourself as the user of technology whether you're using that fundamentally for love. And if I can get slightly mystical with you, okay, God's purposes through the church are for acts of love. So are we using the technology to extend ourselves? Because that's basically what love is in, in various contexts. Or are we hiding from one another? And I can use any electronic electronic technology or probably any other technology either for love or to avoid confrontation. So in an email, I can either use that technology to extend myself, to offer counsel, to offer comfort when I can't be physically present, or I can give somebody the runaround through my email system and avoid them. So whatever the technology is, it doesn't it – doesn't, uh, we're always on the horns of that dilemma. With VR, the, the – the basic problem will remain the same. I will be able to find ways to use that technology to extend myself, to show compassion, to offer Christian counsel, or I can just broadcast myself anonymously to millions of people to try to make some sort of financial profit. That We won't escape that dilemma. And, and let me move into the interpersonal space because I think this is an important point to make. I think that Jonathan and I have probably physically been present with one another <laughs> in probably less than 10 hours total, okay? I would be a guess, but I think that's a bit, and if you took away the Thailand experience, it would be even less, okay? But we have been very much in communication with one another. Uh, we know a little bit about what's going on in each of our lives, et cetera. Um, so it isn't, uh, without being physically proximate, we have been able to have at least some form of connection developed a work relationship with one another, et cetera. And so I sit there and I go, don't underestimate what is possible. And I think the point that Jonathan's making is very important. And that is, it's how you choose to utilize what is in front of you that is the key, not the nature of the medium itself. Now, I will, having said that, I'll make one other point, which I was trying to make earlier, which is what VR and digital allows you to do is to supplement those relational elements that you build when you're in a more intimate environment. But it also allows for some possibilities that you could not do before. So for example, one of the examples I like to use is, and and this will be a particularly vivid example, um, in Acts 27, when you get the teaching in the scripture about being in in, in the storm, you know, when Paul's on the boat and he's moving from Israel and being taken to Rome, et cetera. What VR can do with you is take you and put you in a similar kind of experience in that surround sound mode that you're in. And you can actually impact the speaking. The first time I saw this is I was look, I was on, I had a virtual reality set of goggles on, and I'm an opera fan. So I was watching an opera on VR, and it actually lets you go on the stage next to the person who's singing. Okay, I'd never been that close to the action before. In, uh, in experiencing an opera. And I went, this is really fascinating. I'm really getting to, getting to get up close to the, to the action, if you will, those kinds of things. So, so there's potential here to do certain things that you couldn't have conceived of doing near as effectively, it seems to me, uh, before you had this technology. 
But, but Dan, if I can come back to you, there is no doubt in our minds that this technology will be abused. So as you sort of peer into what would be the dark side or the failure of this technology, I'm sure Dr. Bach and I wholly agree with you. There will be catastrophic consequences, unintended consequences. But my personal position is that I can't stop VR from happening. I can't reverse the the effects of the internet on our culture. But what I do want is that our churches become aware of where these trajectories are taking us and get just enough of the head of the curve to start applying these technologies studiously and reflectively to our to our ministries. And, and thus my remark earlier to you when we were in the meta section, I guess, of this conversation, although I'm not sure we've ever left it, of uh of being a, a techno realist, that what I want people to do is to, to reflect on this theologically in light of what technology can give them, both good and bad, uh, but be aware of what its strengths are, what its potentials are on the one hand, what its weaknesses are on the other, and then think through uh, particularly the more enhancing parts of what is possible uh, through, through these medias. Well, your, your book, that's what I said, you know, earlier, it, it does that so successfully, I think, in, in balancing the two perspectives or the, the, the spectrum, if you will. Um, and, you know, Amy Webb, I don't know if any of you are familiar with her. Amy Webb uh, is a futurist at NYU, and she comes out with her annual report. It really is a, a, a great tool. And uh, her, her brand new report for 2021, um, the Future Today Institute came out just this last week. And she said uh, in, in the report, the combined augmented reality and virtual reality market over the next 10 years represents over $100 billion of innovation that will emerge. And the investment and the power going into this as an innovative tool um, is only going to get stronger. And, and so I, I really do think you're, you're onto something by... So, you know, so Amy read our book is what you're saying. I, I think she That's did. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> That's and, awesome. And, what great news. <laughs> in fact, there was a footnote, you know, right? Uh, but let, so a practical question, I think the average person, the, you know, the, a person that attends church, whether it's a Catholic church or a Protestant evangelical church, um, they they think about this and they hear Avatar or they see you know the VR the classic Mark Zuckerberg uh, GIF where he's walking down the aisle and everybody has the VR glasses on and it looks just otherworldly like like the Matrix um, and they're like how how is one just practically uh, what what do baptisms look like what you know can I can I take communion or the Eucharist you know what 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 does that look like theologically how does that even ha- is this they they think this is science fiction right and and other people are already doing this in reality. So what, um, what are some ideas that you have to help demystify some of those, those conceptions? So I think the most helpful um, theoretical piece to process that question, Dan, comes from Jeremy Balinson. He was the founding professor of um, Stanford University's Virtual Human Interaction Lab, which was the VR lab there at Stanford. And he helpfully reminds us that whenever a new media type comes out, our first instincts, the first instincts of the, of the producers are to replicate what we formally did it in, in the previous medium. So he, the archetypical example of that is when film comes out in the 1920s as a commercial product, what are all the films about? Well, they're, they're filmed versions of vaudeville shows because that's what the actors and the producers knew how to do. So we are exactly in that moment with VR Church. COVID hits and all, we start live streaming all of our services. And what do we do? We all start reproducing a, a physical church service, which actually is a pretty awkward and backward thing to do. But we don't know what else to do. So we're like the, the 1920s films shows that are putting on vaudeville productions in, in film. Okay, but what I do anticipate to take place over quite a longer period of time, maybe half a century, maybe multiple centuries, is a flourishing of liturgical creativity. We are going to have to learn as a global church how to worship together, how to teach together, how to offer pastoral care together. And that's not something we're going to figure out in five years or 10 years or 15 years. This is as big as the Reformation, Dan. And it's going to take generations of people to figure out how to do this in a responsible way. And just imagine a couple of things, okay? Right now, it's goggles. So you're cut off from the person who's around you. But if you actually pay a little bit of attention to Oculus 2, there are times in which 
you're seeing the environment that they're putting in front of you. And there are times you're seeing through that environment to what's going on around you. Imagine if there becomes a way to do that simultaneously so that that obstacle is removed and, and you're operating that way. Or another, another move in another direction. Imagine what it would be like for someone to be preaching in one language and immediately it is rendered into the language that you're used to. Um, and and so, so that really cross-lingual church services that are not obstacles, but actually connect people become possible, that kind of thing. When you get innovations going in that direction, then some of the things that seem so transparent as being a problem now are going to dissolve or at least they're going to take on a different form. I think about the clear screen. I'll make the contrast between the mask that we wear at COVID and the clear screen mask that some people wear. Okay, Two very different ways to attempt to do the same thing, but they function very, very differently in terms of how they operate. So I, I think those are the some of the things that we're headed towards. And, and, and then what that represents in terms of possibility, you know, one of the things that happened to me in COVID, I haven't, I, I used to be on a plane all the time, mm -hmm. traveling to people, places to speak. For sure. In the last year, I have not gotten on a plane in a year. Okay, that's never happened in my life. Um, I haven't gotten on a plane in a year, but I've gone everywhere. Okay, I've probably taught in more distinct continental situations than I did when I was going there uh, physically. Okay, so that that's a huge difference in terms of possibly my wife says they're going to figure it out one day and you're not going anywhere, you know, <laughs> because it costs so much right. uh, to bring me there. So, I mean, those are those are just a sample of the of the swath of what the digital space gives you. Yeah. And that's where the, the promise and perils um or you call it the pitfalls and possibilities in, in the subtitle of your book. You know, I think that's where that conversation really is is profound because we we have to think, what does it mean to be human? What does human interaction look like? And even though it is expensive monetarily, is it, you know, that, that argument from educational theory, what does it look like to be in front of a person embodied, engaging with them um, in person? I, th as long as we articulate that there is a distinct difference between uh, a pixelated Daryl Bach and an in-person Daryl Bach, you know, there, there is something actually different going on. I, I think that's where people have to have the conversation. No, I couldn't agree more. And and there certainly is there is something to the to the touch and the smell, if I can say it that way, mm -hmm. beyond just the voice and the hearing and the seeing uh, that is important. And there is the importance of context. I think one of the things that people have learned about the workplace is all those conversations that used to connect people that happened around water coolers, okay, have been absent in the last year. And uh, and that has done something to the sense of connectedness that people have had, even if they share a job and a project together. There's something lost in that, okay, that you can entirely replicate functioning from a distance. And so there, so that my point is there are advances and there are also step backs in in what goes on technologically, and and you just have to be a realist about about those things, all of them. And Dan, I want to say thank you for bringing us to that point because I think maybe if they haven't read the book, a lot of people might assume that what we're advocating is that everything that happens in a church building can be done just as effectively online. And that's, of course, not what we're advocating. Uh, there are differences in all media. What you can do in a building is and always will remain fundamentally different than what you can do online. But there are a lot of things that you can do online that churches need to be aware of. And a lot of our ministry priorities can begin to be facilitated partially online. So, and that was one of the things that Daryl really pressed us as a team on at every turning point. We can't just dismiss this or wholly embrace it. We have to tease out very specifically what are the unique communicative possibilities here? What are we gaining and what are we losing? One of the groups that I'm one of the groups that I'm in uh, has raised the observation, which I think is true, that you have certain people who will discuss spiritual things online who would never darken the door of a church. So what does that possibility represent for the church? Uh, I think that's a significant that's a significant observation to be making in terms of 
part of what goes on in this space. Um, so you put on goggles, you're in a ver- uh, this happened to me an, a month ago within this group. We were in this group. We were having a private meeting, but it was in an open forum that anyone could come into. And lo and behold, we were all meeting with one another and talking about this virtual experience that we were all sharing together as a group for the first time. And people were wandering in saying, hey, what are y'all doing? Okay. Well, we're, we're a church group meeting together virtually. What? I mean, you know, it was like all the stereotypes were crashing, et cetera, and boom, you had the opportunity to have conversations with people who probably haven't thought about, in some cases, may not have thought about having a spiritual conversation with anybody and probably hadn't done it for months, but they were willing to do it online. Yeah, and and that the the online platforms too are you know really interesting. There's a great anecdote in your book about one of the first ones um, about 20 years ago. You know that that uh, before there were certain kinds of controls, right? That the trolls came in and and absolutely destroyed the experience because they they uh, the access points were all all open. And, and so discussing, I guess, privacy, that's why I feel like we could have this conversation for several hours because of how many pieces of, of modern culture it touches. Um, some people might be interested, you know, Oculus, the company was purchased in 2014 by Facebook um, after just entering the market in 2012 in, in a, as a Kickstarter campaign, if I remember right. And, and so it, it had two years of growth, and then Facebook purchases it in 14. And here, seven years later, we have Oculus 2, and their hardware and software is connected. What, what do you think about some of the privacy concerns? Or, um, as Amy Webb argues, the lack of interoperability between some of these, you know, Google systems, micro, uh, Microsoft systems, and Facebook systems and in other realms uh what, is there privacy issues to you know the the idea of facebook is one of the you know they're in the news they're in front of government regulators at the moment um and here facebook owns this this product that they're obviously going to be scraping data from are, are, are there concerns do you think to be having regarding uh because some of the arguments are this this technology can be used for people in countries we're going to church might, might be illegal. I mean, is, is there kind of a, an obvious privacy issue? There absolutely is, Dan. And, um, and the problem there is simply that the jury is literally and figuratively out on this question. But my enthusiasm for learning to use the technology for ministry purposes um, isn't uh, – I'm not, I'm not trying to avoid – stating that these are very serious uh, privacy issues. In the short term, what that means is that no community will be able to rely wholly on a single platform. So communities that need privacy, for example, underground churches in the Middle East, the first thing that those communities have to learn to do is to decentralize across various media. That means various platforms. And so, um, yes, Facebook, for, for communities that need Privacy. We're talking about churches meeting in countries that don't have full religious freedom. Yes, they're going to have to learn how to use these things very carefully. Well, gentlemen, this is, uh, uh, like I said, that this book itself has been, uh, I, was, I really have appreciated your approach, both the historical angle as, as well as you get into some of the nitty gritty of the, the New Testament arguments or the thoughts of the, of the tensions regarding virtual reality church, what it looks like, what are the, um, as you, again, like you said, the pitfalls and possibilities of these new technologies. Thank you for being stewards of, of not only your talents, um, but your abilities to, uh, to articulate these ideas. And I really do, for those of you listening, highly recommend if you're interested in these digital conversations in this topic theologically, this book will be a, uh, a great asset to your library as you think through for the future what does virtual reality church look like and what could it turn into um, both positively and possibly concerns about it. So please go out and get virtual reality church. We'll put a link on the Act in Line uh, page for this. And, and I just want to encourage, I do have an extra copy. So the first person to email me and request the copy here at the Acton Institute, my email is dchurchwell at acton.org. I will send you a copy. Um, I I believe in it so much. So Dr. Bach and Dr. Uh, Armstrong, thank you so much for joining us today. 
Our absolute pleasure. And I can't think of a better name for someone to uh, to uh, recommend the book than a last name that says Church Well, because you want to do church well. <laughs> Come on, Dan. Let's keep the church healthy. And I hey, can't wait to do this again with you. It's been an honor to work with you. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at actonline at actin.org. Until next week, for Act in Line, I'm Gabriel Zsa Zsa.